the math requirements for getting a high school diploma in the state. I know I'm going to get the tough questions. But, uh, <laughs> I know Dick Evans, Dr. Evans, very well. I, yeah, there's, there are plans. There are always discussions about increasing performance of students by improving the curriculum that we have uh, <coughs> and, and also having an equitable uh, curriculum. There are math teachers and there are math teachers. We do know as a state which high schools are our best performing high schools. We know that those high schools require hard, have higher math requirements. And uh, we know a lot of things about our state. And those are the kinds of issues that as a state we need to begin to talk about. Um, the, the importance of the math and the science cannot be understated in, in the state right now. In terms, and our reading scores are moving up and they are starting to level off this year. Um, so we are looking at as, as a state at all of these kinds of issues in terms of curriculum. Um, it's, it's huge. And I think that for myself, having been commissioner a year and a half, I will say that every person in this room, every person that watches this film, has a responsibility to that process. Uh, local control is huge. It is huge in our state. Um, and that is really going to be very critical in making those kinds of choices about increasing not only the standards that we have in our state and the requirements of courses, but recognizing that every student has a right to a fair and equitable education. The commissioner indicated the local control is significant, and I believe that's where it starts. I believe within each district, we need to look at the, what we have out there in terms of what our current expectations are and what they should be. Uh, one of the most frightening aspects of being a superintendent, I think, is the fact that when you look at what the expectation is on elementary classroom teachers, when you start looking at what they can, what the times they have to offer courses is mind-boggling. It truly is. Uh, the notion of extending the day, I think, is a valuable one to, pers uh, to pursue. But I also know how do you balance that in, with the everyday expectation uh, that's placed upon our educators. We have gone away from, in my opinion, being an educational institution to being a social institution where we're expected to do many things that other agencies and other responsible people should do. Saying that, uh, <laughs> saying that I, I, it definitely has something, we need to do that and we need to do it sooner. By that I mean pre-K, K, one, two, three, and build from there rather than trying to catch up as we find out in the seventh, eighth, and ninth, and tenth grade that, oh my gosh, we've not added up very well. So we need to do that sort of thing as we go forward. Patty Humphrey, did you want a quick so word? So did you, are you going to, uh, are you going to um, increase the requirements? In, in yeah, actually we've already increased our graduation requirements by two. Uh, that's the state standard is 20, oh thank you, 20 credits. <laughs> we are up to 22. I anticipate that we will continue to look at at that type of uh, expansion of coursework. But again, as I said earlier, it's, it's how we focus in on the elementary schools. The earlier intervention is where we re really need to do that and at the same time not lose those folks who have already gone through the system. I liken it to changing a bus on a, a tire on a moving bus. It's very difficult to do. Um, we should do that. Oh, okay. You go. Um, charter schools are, among other things, um, laboratories, experimental schools that can show what's possible, as you saw in the film. In New Hampshire, we have the Academy for Science and Design, which is an accelerated, very high-performing science and math high school. It's in Merrimack. And the students take algebra in seventh grade, and then they go on from there into the higher mathematics as they uh, go through the grades. They also take three sciences every year and, um, and, and have a lot of other very stringent requirements in their curriculum. And uh, so all of you are welcome to go onto their website, see what they're doing, and see if there's anything there that could be incorporated into the curriculum of other schools. I just want to make a quick comment on that because I think it's a great question, and um, I'm always, you know, always for asking the questions before we find 
the solution so that we know we've, we've asked the right question. And I think um, when we look at why is that happening, you know, why do we, are, do we not have enough students who are graduating in competency in math and science, you know, and the film, I think, points out uh, one, one idea, which is, you know, it's the teacher can make a difference. Um, you know, you mentioned the curriculum. I think uh, that's an option, but I think teachers really make a difference. I sit in a console called Advanced Manufacturing and Education Advisory Console, and it's been very interesting because we sit, we're, you know, we have uh, manufacturers sitting with educators and discussing how can, how can education help to advance manufacturing in our communities and prepare students or young people for jobs and have, you know, employees. Um, and it, one of the things that was really interesting is they said they have people come in who really do not have basic math and have graduated from high school, but why aren't they competent in math? And a lot of the, um, uh, just the discussion turned to uh, ideas such as a lot of people are, have a fear of math, and even teachers talk about, well, I really don't like math, but I want to teach it, and I ha or I have to teach, but I really don't like it. Parents talk a lot about, Math was really hard for me. It was really difficult and I didn't like it. So I think there's a cultural change we have a need for in our communities as well to really bring math and science up in our culture to say how important it is having fun with it, educating with good teachers uh, could make a difference as well. It's not all just the curriculum. But I do, um, also the movie talked about tracking and I thought that was very interesting is, you know, maybe today we all need math for a much longer period than we did in 1950s. And we need to look at that with uh, maybe limiting some of the tracking or all tracks are preparing students for success and choices, not just a, a direction um, that is limited. I don't think we should ever put any limitation on a student. So if we see a change in the uh, math requirements for graduation, you know where it began. Another question. Um, yes, Matt. We put a huge focus today on college and career readiness. Um, I'm from Nashua, by the way. I have a 12th grader with an IEP who has been left behind and pushed through your, the National School District. Um, looking back on it, I would today probably have would have sent him to a charter school or a private school. He probably won't even pass the SATs because of his comprehension and reading disability, but he excels in math. He probably won't get accepted to college. What do you say to those students who have been left behind? You have, in today's, you know, school districts, there's no, you don't fund the technology or the software requirements. The teachers are really doing that on their own. So they're not getting that, you know, career readiness from the state. So what do you say to those students? So the question is a, a story from a, a mother from Nashua. Her son is a senior. And uh, he has a learning disability. Yeah. And he has high math skills, but he's clearly facing strong headwinds um, in terms of uh, being able to move on to college. And uh, your comment was that we don't invest in enough technology or enough training with specialists to help children with learning disabilities. And the question to the panel was, what do you do for those children? <laughs> <laughs> I believe that, as someone said earlier, I believe, uh, Senator Kelly said earlier about opportunities for everyone, and we should have those opportunities. One of the things I work with, uh, Mr. Hunter, who happens to be in the audience, uh, he's heading up what we currently call our alternative education program. We're trying to change that language from alternative to opportunity education. That during the entire time that they're in our school district, that they will be given a variety of opportunities. And we are charged with the responsibility as identifying what is the best venue for that individual. I, I disagree with your assessment that your child will not be accepted in college because I think he will or she he's will. Ne he's never had to write a paper. There are colleges. I'll just say that there are places that your child will be able to go and you need to go to your guidance folks now, if you already, I'm sure you already have, but to say, where, where will my son be able to go? Um, it's very difficult when you start looking at the requirements of the IDEA 
special education uh, requirements, but that doesn't give us the excuse of not getting the job done and fulfilling that, that opportunity. So I think what I would say to your son is we will find a place for you and you just keep doing what you can do and at the same time try to shift our focus more toward the aspiration, the, the skill set of the individual. That's why, in, at least in our district, uh, we have a significant uh, policy that allows children to learn in a variety of venues, whether it's through extended learning opportunity, online learning, virtual learning. It's all about learning. And what we need to do is identify how we can direct, guide, shove, push, pull uh, children into that environment.